Neil's going to talk a little bit about moving forward, the pandemic lessons and the economic recovery. Um, I listened to, after the jobs report came out last week, I listened to a Bloomberg podcast that had Neil on it. And the moderators um, talk, uh, spoke of Neil as the, quote, perfect guest. And so I think you can uh, take advantage of that while you're here with him today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Neil. Well, th <clears throat> thank you, Larry. And thank you all for having me. It's great to be with you. I'll just make a few brief opening remarks. Uh, obviously, the U.S. economy was very strong before the pandemic hit. We had a very low unemployment rate, around 3.5% nationally. Wages were growing. They were growing most quickly for the lowest income workers as businesses competed with each other to find workers. That was really good news. And then of course the pandemic hit, COVID hit. It was a shock that none of us, none of us have lived through before leading to a rapid shutdown of the US economy. And then eventually now a reopening of the economy. Well, the economy is reopening, but it's reopening in an uneven manner. You know, we're seeing a lot of pressure. If you look out there, you see a lot of pressure in rental car prices, in travel and transportation as they reopen. You know, consumers really shun services when the pandemic hit because the way to stay safe was to socially distance. So you couldn't harder to go to the barber shop or the beauty salon uh, and be socially distant. So a lot of the spending that went on last year was in goods, buying stuff from Amazon, buying cars instead of buying services. So the good share of the economy expanded a lot while the service sector uh, retracted quite a bit. Now we're shifting away somewhat from goods more towards those services, but some businesses, you, I'm sure you hear about it, I'm sure you experience it in yourself, in your own businesses, they're struggling to find the workforce. So the economy is reopening more quickly than the workforce is coming off the sidelines. So we're very focused on what does the labor market look like uh, how, many Amer <clears throat> excuse me, how many Americans are still out of work? What's it going to take to bring them back into the job market so that the economy can get to full potential? You know, the last jobs report that just came out was a really strong jobs report across the U.S. economy. But even with that strong job report, by our estimation at the Minneapolis Fed, there are still six to eight million Americans who are not working today who would have been working if the pandemic had not happened. Now, why aren't they working? It's a combination of factors. Number one, we know a lot of people are still nervous about COVID, right? We, the health professionals spend a year or 18 months warning us to full and to protect ourselves and our families. So a lot of people are still nervous. And the Delta variant is also causing some people to be cautious. Number two, with so many schools across America shut down, that was a real challenge for families with young children. How can they go back to work if they have to stay home and take care of their children? Well, hopefully the schools will fully be reopened in the fall and that pressure should be relieved. And we also know in many parts of the country, the unemployment benefits were very generous and workers were saying, well, wait a second, I can make just as much money or more money collecting unemployment benefits. Why go back to work? Well, those unemployment benefits now expire all across the country in September. So I wouldn't be surprised if workers are saying, hey, these generous benefits are going to go away in a month. I might as well collect them for one more month because they're going to go away and the job market's probably going to be strong uh, come September. So I think those three factors are real that are keeping some people off the sidelines. The question is, once those fall away, how quickly we can get people back to work? Because that's going to be critical to reaching our full economic potential. And that's what we're trying to assess. So ultimately, we'll get into this in a lot more detail with Larry. Just let me say, the Federal Reserve has what we call a dual mandate. We have two primary goals that we're trying to achieve. One is stable prices. Think about an economy that is growing, but not overheating, not limping along. The other one of our goals is maximum employment, as many Americans as possible, gainfully employed and contributing to our economy. And we think of those two things as sides of a seesaw. As the economy heats up, businesses have to compete to find workers, they have to pay up, that leads to higher wages and then higher prices. And so the labor market and the economy, we think are tightly linked and we're monitoring both sides of that seesaw. We are seeing some high prices right now, which I know Larry and I are gonna talk about, but I still see a lot of slack in the labor market. I expect more workers to come online. And I think that's gonna help our, that'll help relieve some of that inflation pressure 
but that'll also boost our economy's potential. And so I'm really excited to be here. I love Montana is part of the region of the Minneapolis Fed. So we have a responsibility to know what's happening in the Montana economy. We have uh, employees in our branch office in Helena who monitor uh, Montana on a daily basis for us, but I'm always excited every chance I get to come out and visit. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Neil. Um, there are two microphones set up, so I would encourage you to uh, ask questions. Um, so we'll, while you're thinking of a question, um, let me get started, Neil, with just one. Obviously, the topic that people are talking about is inflation. So talk about inflation, how you look at it, you know, short term and long term and how you see inflation. Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier, the economy went through a rapid shutdown. And now it's going through a rapid reopening. And we're seeing many sectors of the economy where businesses are struggling to manage that reopening. And in many cases, that reopening could involve a global supply chain. And there are bottlenecks at ports. And there are other parts of the world where COVID is still a big problem. So they're having trouble getting parts that they need to, to feed their operations here in America. I'll give you a couple examples. A year ago, it was very hard to find toilet paper. I do the shopping for my family. I would go into the grocery store. I'd go into Walmart. I'd go into Target. And the shelves were bare for toilet paper. Now, when you go to the grocery store, the shelves are full. Lumber prices. I know, I'm sure you all know, lumber prices skyrocketed. Now they're falling back down to earth. Those are examples of adjustments that can lead to temporary price surges. I'm not discounting them. I'm not saying those aren't real. We had to pay them but they were short-lived as the business community had to adjust to the new environment that we were in. So a lot of what we're seeing right now in these elevated prices are concentrated in a handful of sectors. We know the auto sector is under, uh, has a, a lot of demand right now and they're having troubles with chips uh, coming from abroad. We know that travel and transportation sectors are also reopening really quickly. Like all these pilots were put on ice for furloughed for a while, and now they're having to bring them back in. They're having to get the planes you know, retrofitted and ready to uh, go up in the air again. There are a lot of those adjustments taking place. A lot of hotel work, hotels laid off their staffs, and now they're having to staff up uh, very quickly. So we're not surprised to see some of these price surges concentrated in some of these sectors. That's why I believe this will be a short-lived, a transitory uh, high inflation readings. We're not yet seeing a lot of high pressures across the broader economy, but we're not um, drawing firm conclusions yet. We're monitoring the data very closely to see, are these high inflation readings really going to be temporary or not? And the last thing I'll say, I do think it is tightly linked ultimately to the labor market. If the six to 8 million workers who should be working right now, if they're never coming back for whatever reason, then that would give me more concern that maybe the economy is overheating and maybe we are gonna see sustained high inflation because six to 8 million workers represents a lot of economic potential. I am not ready to draw that conclusion. My base case scenario is people do wanna work and they are going to come back into the labor market. That's what we saw in the last expansion. Every time we thought we were out of workers, wages started to climb and Americans came off the sidelines and went back to work. Most Americans wanna work. And sir, and thanks for using the mic. Just, I wanna give you a warning that we are live streaming this on the Minneapolis Fed's website. So, you know, fire away any question you'd like, but you're not, you may not be as anonymous as you think. Uh, I'm John Brendan. Usually I don't need a mic, uh, but anyway, I'm the governor's representative on Penwar. And I've been in politics almost 60 years. And so I've seen all these peaks and, and valleys and what have you over my lifetime. But I'm really concerned about uh, this 1.3 or $4 trillion infrastructure bill, which actually only 23% goes for actual hard infrastructure like roads and bridges and it's that kind of stuff. And now they're talking about another three and a half trillion. And the way that the government is borrowing money how do we sustain that or possibly ever pay close to $30 trillion back? I mean, I, I really concerns me 
as far as uh, my country goes, as my state goes, for my children, my grandchildren, how, how can we sustain that kind of a deal? What is your idea on that? Well, thank you for your question. Uh, it's a big, very complicated topic, and let me get at it a few different ways. Let me start by saying the way you frame the question, I agree with, which is there is a difference between the government borrowing money to fund investments and the government borrowing money to fund essentially consumption. And while consumption, for example, could have maybe for childcare, maybe for healthcare, those all may well be very good, important things for society. They don't by themselves lead to a direct payback versus uh, funding investment. So just as a, at a high level matter, I personally think the government borrowing money at very low interest rates to fund long-term investment, that doesn't give me concern. But if you say, well, the government's just gonna have ever increasing spending year after year after year on what is essentially consumption, we know that cannot go on forever. And I would say, just to give you an example, here in Montana, when I travel around Montana or North Dakota or South Dakota or Minnesota, one of the biggest needs we have is we need better broadband internet for all of our regions. And so, welcome to clap. If, if this is, I hope that this infrastructure bill is once and for all really gonna take care of that so that everybody in America can ac get access to broadband internet. We've seen now, if you have access to broadband internet, a lot of things are possible that we didn't realize were possible. So I hope that that is a major part of whatever the final infrastructure plan is. But ultimately, where is the debt limit for the US government? When if Once you get beyond it, we believe that leads to inflation. We believe you have too many, too much demand for goods and services that is exceeding the supply potential of our economy, and that just leads to higher prices. But where that should show up is in the rate that the US government borrows at, because investors will look at that deficit spending, they'll look at what it's being spent on, and they're gonna say, hey, I think inflation is coming, I'm gonna demand a higher return to loan money to the government. That's not happening so far. That the US Treasury is borrowing at very, very low rates, even with these high deficits today and potentially higher deficits in the future. That doesn't mean it can go on forever. But I'll be honest with you, nobody knows exactly where the limit is. Is the limit $25 trillion? Is it $30 trillion? Is it $50 trillion? We don't know. And so ultimately it ends up being a judgment call and it ends up being a political call among our elected leaders to decide how much is too much. But I mean, I, I sh I'm sympathetic with your underlying concern. Nobody knows what that, what that line is, unfortunately. And so it's kind of easy to keep doing what we've been doing because we haven't felt pressure yet. Hi, I'm uh, Danny Tenenbaum. I'm a representative, uh, state representative from Missoula. One question I have is about housing affordability. And I think myself and all of my colleagues in the legislature, we recognize that there is probably a housing shortage in Montana. And I think other states are experiencing that as well in provinces. What are some steps that you have seen or that you would point to for state and local governments to help their constituents find homes? So thanks for asking the question. Everywhere I travel, this is a, a, a top issue. Red state, blue state, red county, blue county, it does not matter. It cuts across partisan lines. And I always ask the question, like I drove in, Larry and I drove in from the airport. And I said, I, he told me how expensive housing is. And I said, look at all of this undeveloped land. What's going on? How can house prices be so high when there's your land rich, land plentiful? This isn't Manhattan. There's a lot of land around here. Everywhere you go, when you really get to the root of the problem, there are local and state regulations and ordinances preventing supply from coming online. The people who live in a community like the community the way it is, they don't want any more neighbors. They like their big lot sizes. They don't want subdivided lot sizes. They want minimum number of bedrooms. They want minimum number of garage spaces. Each one of these by itself doesn't seem like a big deal. When you add it up, it ends up raising the minimum cost of a unit, directly affecting affordability. This is something the federal government actually cannot solve because 95% of these rules 
are designed at the local level. And so you don't like the cost of housing, you and I need to take a hard look in the mirror because we are the reason the cost of housing is the way it is. And that's it, that's the cold hard truth. There is no way, there is no way the government can subsidize your way out of this because it affects almost everybody. You can't ask everybody to subsidize themselves. That doesn't work. And so ultimately it is about, you know, I'll give you one more example. I was visiting a manufacturer in Northern Minnesota in Duluth, which is not a big metropolis. And the, they just hired a new CFO. And he told me he couldn't believe how expensive it was for him and his family to buy a house in Duluth. And I asked him, I said, where'd you move from? What little town did you move from? Do you know where he moved from? Houston, Texas. If Duluth is more expensive than Houston, Texas, we're doing something wrong. It is all about our own decisions at the local and state level. Neil, before we go on to the next question, just um, I think it'd be helpful to expand on the previous question about the federal debt. I mean, as we talk about it, we look at 10-year treasuries, the market's saying, I'm okay with this so far. Um, but talk about monetary policy versus the fiscal policy of that equation and how you think about the monetary policy of, of, um, uh, of dealing with that issue. So we at the, there's a clear distinction between fiscal and monetary policy. So fiscal policy is how much you and I are taxed, what rate we pay taxes at the state, local, and federal level, and then how our tax dollars are spent, whether it's roads or bridges or defense, healthcare, education. And those are the political system makes those choices. Separate from that is monetary policy, which is the Federal Reserve basically moves interest rates up and down to try to manage the ups and downs of the US economy. And it's designed to be insulated from day-to-day -day politics. Uh, we keep politics you know, outside of the Federal Reserve and we just focus on the data to try to say what's right for the US economy for these dual mandate of maximum employment and stable prices that I talked about. So if we saw hypothetically at some point in the future that the US government was running very, very large deficits and investors around the world said, hey, we're worried about inflation and that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, you start to see high inflation, the Federal Reserve would then say, well, we would have to tighten monetary policy, raise interest rates to keep inflation in check, even if that was not politically popular. Some of you might be old enough to remember the 1970s had very high inflation and the Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker dramatically raised interest rates to break the back of inflation, but it was very painful. It caused a recession in the US economy, but ultimately it was successful. That was the kind of thing that'd be very hard for elected officials to do because their constituents would be mad at them, but it was the right thing to do for the, for the country. So that's the distinction that we make. So we don't actually pay attention to what is the treasury's deficit position what are their plans for deficit spending? We look at the data on inflation and on the labor market to set interest rates and say, hey, it's up to Treasury and up to Congress to determine how much they want to spend and how they fund themselves. And that's the distinction that we make. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Richard Gottfried, MLA from Alberta. Thank you for your comments on housing. Uh, we certainly have that, that uh, problem in Canada, I think even more pronounced than you have in the United States. And I would say it's probably because of a generation of social engineers who are limiting land supply and causing some real problems and, and severe inflation on the housing side. So uh, thank you for that comment. Just a couple of, of comments, questions. Number one, uh, with respect to um, uh, the, uh, the, the crystal ball that none of us have, we've come through the most 17 most unpredictable months in our lives. And now we're trying to predict uh, what's gonna happen in the next uh, two, four, six months or a year. And um, I'd just like you to maybe comment on, on the risks that you see for government and for industry in that regard. And, uh, and then the second thing uh, you commented about the labor issue, and, and I just wanted to, to maybe also get your comments on that labor supply concerns we have. We, we see that this reluctance perhaps of some of the younger generation coming back into the workforce, but very, we have very little conversation about the baby boomers who are timing out of the workforce as well, which is as big a problem in, in, the, uh, in industry as well. So maybe some comments on a few of those issues, if you would, thank you. Well, um, in terms of some of the challenges and some of the risks that we see, the Delta variant is a risk. Like I was feeling really optimistic in June and July that it seemed like the light was on, light at the end of the tunnel, and this was soon to be over. And then the Delta variant emerged and it's just simply much more contagious 
according to the health experts that I speak with, which is really uh, you know, a big frustration. So we have, I'll just give an example, the Minneapolis Fed, we had planned to bring our 1,100 workers back into our facilities in mid-September. We've now delayed it by at least a month and we're gonna monitor things on when we can bring everybody back. So you know, it could lead to a more sluggish recovery if people are nervous. So if, if we're not bringing our workers back into downtown, then the restaurants and the shops around our facility, they're all affected by that. And we're not the only one making that decision. So you know, there are gonna be broader economic implications. And you saw, you may have seen that retail sales data came out today it was softer than expected. Now, is that because people are nervous about Delta? You know, it's possible. Is it because the fiscal stimulus is waning? That's certainly you know, part of it, but these are things that we're gonna be monitoring. So, you know, the pandemic, it seems like the health experts are saying that this pandemic is going to become endemic. What that means is we're gonna to learn to live with this uh, circulating in our society, much as we do with the flu. That transition to get to an endemic level where it's more flu-like, there's a lot of uncertainty associated with that. You know, if in 2009, I didn't even remember this. In 2009, we had a swine flu outbreak in America and 60 million people got swine flu, but I think only 20 or 30,000 people died from it. So we weren't masking up, we weren't socially distancing, we weren't staying at home because it wasn't that dangerous. If we can get to that kind of a place with COVID where, you know, it comes and goes, but it's not that dangerous, that'll certainly be a better outcome, but it'll probably take a while for us to get there. So there's a lot of risk, I think, associated with that. People, a lot of people point to the stock market as valuations are high, it's, it's hitting new highs. Um, you know, could there be a pullback? Sure, there could be a pullback. Just like maybe, maybe you wanna say there's a bubble in the stock market. Well, when the tech bubble burst, it caused a mild recession. It didn't cause a financial crisis. So that's something we pay a lot of attention to, but I'm not worried about stocks themselves readjusting. Stocks go up, stocks go down, you know, so be it. We do have a team of people at the Federal Reserve looking out for financial stability risks. What could cause a financial crisis the way we had in 2008? The big banks are something that I'm always concerned about. They are in a stronger position than they were before the 08 crisis. They're not strong enough, according to me, but they're stronger than they were. Uh, so that gives me some confidence. So we're always looking out. And I'll tell you this, we were looking out for risks across the global economy and none of us saw COVID coming. So just because we don't see a, a crisis around the corner, you know, don't take much comfort from that. The nature of crises is we rarely see them. And then in terms of the workforce, I mean, there are a lot of the uncertainties you talked about, I'll say this, in the last expansion, businesses kept saying in 2016, 2017, 2018, we can't find workers, we can't find workers, we can't find workers. And then you know what they finally did as a last ditch effort? They started to pay more. And then lo and behold, workers came off the sidelines and started to take jobs and we didn't think they were available. You know, we, we, the government surveys workers in America, surveys Americans, they call you up and they ask you, do you have a job? Yes or no? Are you looking for a job? So some people say, I don't have a job. I'm not looking for a job. So you're not counted as unemployed if you say you're not looking for work. But you know what a lot of those people do? The next month, they take a job. So how many people are out there that actually do want to work and maybe don't realize it? Could be a lot. And there were a bunch of Americans in the last expansion who were getting older and who by the statistics we thought would have retired. And they said, hey, you know what? Business is pretty good right now. Wages are pretty good right now. Maybe I'm going to work for a few more years. That was great news. Great news for them. Great news for our economy. So I'm not ready to write off those folks who've said, hey, I'm done because of COVID. I'm not coming back. I don't believe them. I'll believe them in a few years if they're still retired. You know, let's see after we get this COVID thing behind us. And if wages keep picking up, I think they're going to surprise us and say, hey, that job looks pretty good. Is the um, labor force participation rate one of the things that we can look to to see how we're progressing to what you talked about? Is that a good place? It is labor force participation. So that's the number of people who are employed or who say they want to have a job. Another, a cleaner measure is just employment to population, which is how many, what percentage of adults have a job. And an even cleaner measure is what percentage of prime age adults, which is roughly 25 to 55, have a job, because you don't expect there to be many retirees in 25 to 55. When you, when you get up into older Americans, then you would expect to see more retirement. So we look at all of these measures. No one measure is perfect, but we do still have a gap 
So the unemployment rate has a ways still to go to get back to pre-COVID levels. And those labor force participation and employment to population also have gaps, which suggest that there still is a slack on the sidelines. Next question. Yeah, Butch Gillespie, uh, Senate District 9, up along the eastern side of the mountain front in the Golden Triangle area. Uh, you've kind of answered probably three-fourths of my question. It was going to be on un unemployment exactly. It seems like there's so many different ways to figure it. When you hear about it on the news, you're never really quite sure, you know, how serious is it or, or how optimistic should we feel about it? So any comments on that that you might have other than what you've already said? And uh, then I am one of those individuals that happen to live through those 18, 20% interest rates with borrowed money at the time. And uh, us guys that, and gals that were there at that time don't want to have to go through another one. That's why we do get really concerned when we see the government uh, borrowing a ton of money or spending a ton of money. Well, Thank you. Enjoy yeah. your comments. Thank you, sir. Let, let me say, let me start with the inflation piece for a second. One thing that happened last year in the height of the crisis, prices fell. Think about oil prices. Oil prices plummeted last year, and now they're back up 65 bucks a barrel, something like that, 70 bucks a barrel. Well, even if prices fell and then right, right back to where they were, in that second year, it's going to look like really high inflation, even if they're just going back to where they were. So another way of looking at inflation to get past this V is look at an average two-year inflation. Well, average two-year inflation is roughly 2.3 or 2.4%. That also gives me some comfort that a lot of what we're seeing is just math of prices falling and then prices bouncing back. But we look at a lot of different measures to make sure that we're not going to go back to the 18 or 20% interest rates that the gentleman was talking about. Now, one other comment I'm just going to make about the job market. You know, I meet with a lot of businesses, small businesses, big businesses, and they're always complaining that they can't find workers. You know, if the price of steel goes up or the price of corn goes up or the price of oil goes up, they may not like it. It's an input to their business, but they shrug their shoulders and they say, darn it, that's the market. I got to pay it. But if they can't find workers at wages they were used to paying, my gosh, it is a historic worker shortage. There are no workers out there. I always ask them, have you tried raising wages? You'd be surprised how many times they say no. Less so now, but over the last few years, you'd be surprised how many times they said no. So I was in North Dakota in a round table of small businesses, and they were going on and on and on about a worker shortage. And I asked them, I said, do me a favor and tell me, when was the last time you saw a good labor market? And they thought about it. And they said, you know, 2009 was pretty good. Okay, we were in the middle of a terrible recession. We had 10% unemployment, but man, from business's perspective, that was a heck of a good time to be hiring. So it's, I really take labor shortage complaints now, having been on this job for almost six years. I take it with about 10 pounds of salt on my chips on my shoulders, big salt chips on my shoulders, because I've heard these stories before. And I, I am always positively surprised by most Americans want to work want to put food on the table, want to provide for themselves if given the chance to get a decent job at a decent wage. Hey, uh, good afternoon, Neil. Tom Cape uh, with Mitsubishi Power. So I wanted to drill down into monetary policy just a little bit. There's a couple of thematics you'll be very familiar with that are happening in the market. So my first question is your thoughts on Fed tapering uh, on, asset, on the asset purchase side. It seems to me like the market are expecting this to happen. So it's more of a when as opposed to an if. And it's really relatively priced into the, to the treasury market today. The second one I'd love to hear your thoughts on is a rate hike. Now that I do not think is priced into the market and perhaps is more dependent on the, on the jobs side, um, but would love to hear your thoughts on both of those. And thanks again for your time. Sure. So the first question is on the Fed's asset purchases. So the primary policy tool we have to boost the economy is we lower this interest rate called the federal funds rate that banks charge each other. Once we get that down to zero, the question is, are we out of ammunition? The answer is no. We can drive down long-term rates by buying assets in something called quantitative easing. We buy US government debt and mortgage-backed securities, and that drives down long-term interest rates. And we started doing that in the 08 crisis, 
Then eventually we tapered that off and we started shrinking our portfolio. Then when the COVID shock happened again, we cut the federal funds rate to zero and started the asset purchases again. We have said, as of December of last year, that we would begin tapering those asset purchases when we saw substantial further progress against our goals. So we inflation is a little bit high right now, as we talked about. We've made some progress in the job market. The question is, when will we have made substantial further progress in the job market? To the gentleman's question, you are right. It is a question of when, not a question of if. And that's what the committee is going to be deliberating over. When has the labor market made enough progress that we can relax this one tool? There's a lot of public discussion about, will it be at the end of this year? Will it be, get, be at the beginning of next year? Those seem like reasonable ranges of deliberation, but ultimately it will be driven by the data. So it is a question of when, not a question of if. And then in terms of the, lifting the federal funds rate off, we have committed ourselves to a new approach to monetary policy that we're not gonna raise interest rates in anticipation that we are going to reach maximum employment and that inflation is going to come that we are gonna wait until we actually achieve maximum employment until we've actually achieved our inflation target and see inflation climbing over time. That's gonna depend on the recovery. That's gonna depend on the data. Um, you know, My best guess right now is we're a few years away from raising the federal funds rate, uh, but how long that ultimately takes, it's gonna depend on the job market. We thought the job market this spring and summer would be much stronger than it was. Then we had a very good job report last month you know, I don't want to prejudge it. Let's see what ends up happening for the rest of this year in terms of asset tapering. Then we have to see what happens next year in terms of the actual federal funds rate. I'm Tom Schultz, uh, host of Voices of Montana. Thank you for being here and taking questions. Um, speaking of when versus if, and maybe a, it's a, a sidetrack, but how has the pandemic affected the solvency of social security? How has the labor market affected the solvency? of social security and does the Fed Reserve, um, does it come up in your discussions? Uh, do you have a role to play in protecting the solvency of social security? We, we do not have any role. That is purely the domain of fiscal policy with Congress and the executive branch and the treasury department and the social security administration. So I'll be honest, nothing we deliberate about, but I'll just give you a quick uh, view on it, which is it really depends on the workforce. I mean, many of our entitlement programs, including social security, are funded by current workers paying for current retirees. Now we have a demographics problem in America, most modern advanced economies do, which is we're having fewer children than prior generations. So that ratio of current workers to current retirees is going down. And that means those programs are going into the red. So our political leaders are gonna to have to make tough choices about how to bring those programs back into balance over the long term. But then it comes back to a more current topic which is the six to eight million Americans who are not working right now. We need to get them back in. We need to get them back in for their own sake. We need to get them back in for our economy's potential sake. And if we get them back in, they will be contributing to social security to help make that program more resilient. So that is something that we do have some influence over at the Federal Reserve to try to achieve maximum employment, but we don't have any ability to address the longer term demographic structural issue that we're facing as a society. Hi, asking a little bit different question. Uh, I'm with the state of Montana, Department of Agriculture, I'm an attorney. And, and the changes we've noticed in retaining employees when looking at employees is having gone remote for a period of time, years. Both things like the Americans with Disabilities Act, your analysis is now completely different because it's hard to justify that you couldn't do the job remotely or with much different accommodations. But also when looking at retaining workers, while wages are a part of the discussion, it's really work environment and flexibility and where they can work from, when they can work and what level of flexibility for childcare is gonna be built into those jobs that our existing workers are demanding if we want to keep them. And I think that's a very different change and I've certainly noticed it even when we, I keep track of job solicitations for people with law degrees, just for fun. And certainly <laughs> the offer on the dollar amount does not go up but the flexibility employers are willing to offer senior seasoned attorneys has vastly improved in the last year. And I think those changes may be more permanent than even some of the wages that you're seeing at Taco Bell. Any I, comments? Yeah, I think you're right that some of those changes are gonna be more permanent, but I also, my own gut tells me 
some employers who are jumping to this, we're in this new world, this new world's here forever. I think it's premature to draw that conclusion. We're having this deliberation in our own bank as well. We have 1,100 employees. Many of our staff have said, boy, this worked pretty well working from home. I like this. You know, I think about the future. Imagine, imagine if you gave your employees an option. You can work from home. You can come on site. Up to you. How do you avoid having a two-tier workforce where some workers who are there building relationships with their colleagues, working together collaboratively, aren't they naturally going to get more mentorship, more opportunities, more advancement in their careers? It's hard for me to imagine that not happening, no matter how fair you want to be. And so I just think about what does the world look like in four or five years if we just blindly go down this path? It is not obvious to me it is going to be better off for those people who are asking for it even. And so, you know, my, my humble suggestion and what we're going to do at our bank is we're going slowly and we're going to learn a lot of employers. Larry and I were talking about this for his own firm. A lot of firms are having to experiment right now. You know, I think we're going to learn from each other and try to get to a place that is better for everyone. But I, it isn't obvious to me that the answer is clear right now. Neil, I represent farm equipment dealers in the U.S. and Canada, and my question is about uh, the distinction made between the labor participation rate for urban and rural areas. And it sort of ties into this COVID question, remote work. For the last two decades or more, we've seen the trend towards uh, the shift of demographics to urban areas. COVID kind of switched that a little bit for the first time. We've seen people retreating to more rural areas. We see that in Montana. My question is in the labor participation rate and just in labor in general, uh, do you make that distinction between the rural and urban? Have you seen any trends in that rural area for you know, more workers or, or greater participation rate or less even? We don't, um, it's, uh, I don't have the data at my fingertips. Generally speaking, I would say the unemployment rate across rural areas has been very, very low because the people who are, either they leave to find work, as you said, they leave to go to college, maybe they don't come back. But generally, there is a tight labor market, even in rural communities. It's the lack of population in the rural communities, which is really driving the decline of many small towns. But you're right. It may well be that one of the upsides of this COVID pandemic is now all of a sudden that dynamic can change. But that goes back to the infrastructure investment. There's got to be the broadband availability in all those rural communities to take full advantage of that potential. But, you know, I hope it's real. I mean, I hope we can really wire America for true ubiquitous broadband, people will be able to live where they want, subject to the conversation I just had with the prior gentleman about what are the dynamics gonna be, who is their employer gonna be, what's that really gonna be like? I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty, but I think more options for workers, for families, and for businesses is gonna be better. Okay, I got a quick softball for you. Uh, Matt Binky, State Representative, Washington State. We're a technology leader, you know, at Microsoft, all the big keys. How do you, what are your thoughts on the digital economy as we move forward? Primarily following what Miami has been doing with Bitcoin, having their own now Miami coin of getting into that cryptocurrency market. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you, I was more optimistic about crypto and Bitcoin five or six years ago. Uh, so far, what I've seen is 99%, 95%, let me give them a, let me be charitable, 95% fraud, hype, noise, and confusion. Um, you know, why is the dollar so valuable? Because the U.S. government has a monopoly on producing dollars. If you go in your basement and you want to start producing your own currency, the Secret Service is going to come knock on your door and put you in handcuffs. There is no barrier to you creating your own Bitcoin or me creating my own. I'll call it Neil coin. Maybe I can't call it Bitcoin. I'll call it Neil's Bitcoin, and then Larry can create Larry coin. And there are thousands of these garbage coins that have been created. Some of them are complete fraud Ponzi schemes where they pump it up, they dupe people to investing money, and then the founders rip them off. I mean, I always ask people, what problem are you trying to solve? And nobody can articulate what the actual problem is. They say, oh, we don't want to be Venezuela. Yeah, I agree. I don't want to be Venezuela either. Uh, I don't see any evidence that the US government or the United States of America is on a path of Venezuela. Uh, and so, you know, I don't want to say it's impossible that something useful would come out of this. It's certainly possible, but I've not seen any use case 
other than funding illicit activities like drugs and prostitution, I have not seen any use case that is legitimate so far that Bitcoin solves. But if you want to launch Montana coin, don't let me stop you. Uh, Neil, the, Matt Morrison Penware, um, somewhat related, but we, you know, here in America, we have been so fortunate that the world uses our currency for the basis of everything. What is the risk going forward as we have larger and larger deficits that this could change? You know, it's, a, it's another good question, which is impossible to know, it's possible to quantify for me, but I'll tell you this, it is a relative game. It is a position of relative strength. So imagine a scenario that Europe really gets its political house in order. And all of a sudden investors around the world will say, wow, Europe looks like a really attractive place to invest. I'm gonna invest there instead of America. That would all of a sudden shorten our runway of having the global reserve currency. Or imagine China. You know, a lot of people are, I remember when I was growing up in the 80s, everyone was terrified of Japan Inc. Japan was gonna run circles around America. They were an unstoppable juggernaut. And then reality caught up and America's competitive economy continued to grow. Now there's all this China fear. Well, you know, China just started cracking down on their own tech companies for raising money abroad. You know, they're not punishing us. They're punishing their own companies. And that's a heck of a chilling signal to send to innovators around the world. Do you really want to innovate in China if at the drop of a hat, the government could just come in and say, we don't like what you're doing, we're going to take it. Wow. Now all of a sudden, in my eyes, China doesn't look as formidable. So, you know, I, don't, I would never bet against America. We have our challenges. We all know our challenges. But every other major economy has big challenges too. And I wouldn't trade places with any of them. Before we go to the next question, just, you know, we were talking about inflation, just to add a little bit more in inflation. Um, two things, you know, inputs and labor. Um, for us, I mean, I think inputs and for a lot of the companies out here, we've got a lot of muscle memory from what's happened in the past. For instance, um, you know, parts that we, you know, were just in time on, once we got stung on it in 2009 and, and different periods of time, we've stocked those rather than have tires is the perfect example. We used to carry no mine tires. Now we've got six months of tires. And so as prices go up, we're, we're able to sit back and wait. We don't have to react right away. So the inflation for parts other than fuel, and as, as you noted, this is a short-term thing. Um, we haven't, we've, we've structured ourselves in a way that we haven't had the experiences we had in the past. That's one. Two, on the labor market, I think during COVID, um, we didn't add any people, right? So nobody was added. We're still growing. Um, in a normal times, we probably would have added more people. And now that, it, now that we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, labor is more expensive. We're giving COVID bonuses. We're doing those types of things. But our overall cost of labor for what it would be is not up because we have fewer people and people, I think during COVID, we figured out a lot of places to be more efficient. And so places where we would have added more people, we figured out ways to do it with fewer people costing more, but the total labor cost is not inflationary for the overall business. So I, like to your point, I think there's a whole bunch of factors out there that are impacting that. that that's really interesting. You know, uh, it reminds me, pre-pandemic, so several, a few years ago, one of the directors on our board, Larry was a wonderful director for six years. One of our directors was a power company CEO. And he said, one of the huge challenges in the power industry is that all these linemen, the mostly men who go out and work on the power lines, they're retiring and it's an older workforce and they're gonna have this massive brain drain labor shortage of all this wave of retirees and they don't know what they're gonna do. So. A couple of years go by and I remembered his comment and I said, hey, uh, David, what happened? Did you keep the power on? You know, what happened? Did you run out of workers? He said, oh, no, we solved it. It was not a problem. I said, well, how'd you solve it? He said, you know, what we ended up doing, we paid a handful of the most productive senior workers some extra money to stay around for a few more years. And then we adopted technology. We use FaceTime. So before, when we would send a, a younger worker out into the field, 
we'd pair him up with a more senior lineman. Now he can go out on the field and he FaceTimes the more senior lineman who's on a different job and he walks him through it. And then the more junior guy can complete the job having gotten some guidance from the senior guy and they can do two jobs at the same time when they used to only be able to do one. I mean, how great is that? But they were forced to do that just like we were all forced to, I never used Zoom before the pandemic. We were all forced to adopt these technologies and the technologies have improved even in the last year or 18 months. So hopefully some of this productivity is going to stick with us. Next question. Hey, um, I just want to go down on record. I gave a presentation earlier today and didn't get a single question. So, <laughs> so I think you're a lot more interesting than I am. Hey, um, I, I wanted to follow up. So you said earlier, um, you were talking about uh, inflation perhaps being transitory. You know, give me some advice over the next 12 months. You know, I'm in a business where I used to get 12 month pricing validity from my suppliers without much problem. And those same suppliers won't even give me like a two week pricing validity now because things are changing so rapidly. How do you, I mean, so it's easy to sort of talk at the macro, like, you know, maybe we, like lumber went up and now it's come back down, but how do you think that's all going to sort of play out, you know, sort of the next level down in terms of things like pricing validity and you know, I, I wish I could give you good advice and I'm sorry that I can't. It's going to be very sector specific. You know, I'll give you an example. The semiconductor factories take years to build. And the CEOs of the big semiconductor companies like Intel have said, they're gonna see shortages and high prices probably for a couple of years. Other sectors, you know, lumber we talked about have fallen right back down to earth. Other sectors can adjust more quickly and so, I would just say to you with respect, you're gonna to have to look at these various inputs and try to determine which ones you think are gonna be longer lasting and which ones you think can catch up more quickly and maybe talk to your suppliers and ask them, hey, what do you think? How long is it gonna to take to get this backlog uh, cleared out? It's, I think it's gonna unfortunately be on a very sector specific basis, which is gonna be based on the products and how global are the supply chains, uh, how service oriented are they versus how manufacturing oriented are they? It's a complicated question, and I'm, I know it's not going to be easy to answer. Uh, thanks. We have a question from online. One of our uh, attendees had a question uh, in regards to the future. Is it possible for all businesses to pay into an insurance fund if they choose to remain open? And then is there evidence to suggest that big box retailers like Amazon were able to um, uh, weather the, uh, um, the outbreak uh, better because of that? Uh, cash reserve to build back off on? Well, it, it's a good question. One of the things Congress, you know, I really want to applaud them, both sides of the aisle came together very aggressively to support small businesses and mid-sized businesses and even some big businesses to keep them solvent through the pandemic. You know, you go through this terrible shutdown, you can have a lot of devastation, long-term devastation, not only for workers, but if all these thousands and thousands and thousands of businesses go under, takes a long time to form new businesses to go take that vacant space to hire up the staff. And so, but it's a policy question is, should there be an insurance fund instead of Congress acting? Imagine if there was an insurance fund that everybody would just pay into. That's a good, interesting political policy question. I don't have a strong view. In a sense, you could think of the American taxpayer is an insurance fund at a very macro level. You could have a more targeted one um, ready to go. What was the second part of your question? It was, it was just, I guess they wanted to know what the evidence was as far as the uh, uh, way the big, Amazon and big box retailers were able to, uh, to well, remain open. And yeah, I think the big companies, generally speaking, have more financial avenues than the small companies. You know, big businesses were able to tap the capital markets, the bond market, people, you know, issuing record debt levels in the bond market to try to fund themselves so they had a cash buffer. So I do think bigger businesses had more just more options during the pandemic, drawing down credit lines from big banks, as an example. And that's why I do think it was so important for Congress to step up to support small businesses, which had fewer options of their own. Okay, I think we've got time for one more question, but maybe I'll close with this, Neil. Um, I think one of the things that when you see Neil Kashkari's name, it's after a big jobs report or after a retail sales or after an FOMC meeting. 
Uh, but I think the most fascinating thing about how engaging Neil is today and, um, and you know, during this COVID crisis is where he goes for information. And, um, you know, the ability for him to talk to you about your business, he truly wants to know what you're doing in the business. So as these decisions are made on the economy, they're not made by the data that you think is connected with Neil. But one of the most interesting things I think that we talked about earlier is just how close you were to COVID and all the resources that you use, one of the top doctors at the University of Minnesota, um, to track the pandemic versus the New York Times tracker, which all of us were looking at. So maybe just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, when the COVID crisis hit, I mean, none of us had studied pandemics before. And so we had to drop everything and learn everything we could. And one of the neat things about being at the Federal Reserve is you can call up the best experts in the world and they will usually make themselves available to share with you what the latest is. And we have one of the real top ones at the University of Minnesota, Dr. Mike Osterholm. You know, Dr. Osterholm was criticized because people said he was too negative. He was dead on. I mean, in March and April of 2020, he told me, this is gonna be 18 months to two years. You're gonna see flare ups in some part of the country and not in other parts of the country. And you're gonna wonder why. Is it something they did? Was it policy choices or is it just random? We're not gonna know. And all these dynamics that he tried to prepare me for, because that made me think of what do we as an economy have to get through? It's not likely gonna be two months. It's likely gonna be 18 months or two years. How do we think about positioning our economy to get through that? And so, I mean, it was all hands on deck to learn as much as we could. And the health experts, this was, in some ways it was similar to prior pandemics, but each pandemic is unique. So the health experts were struggling and they were honest about what they knew and what they didn't know. The, the thing they got wrong, which I'm really happy about, is they all said getting a vaccine that's effective is a really uncertain proposition. It might take us years to get a single vaccine that works. So it is a miracle of science that we have multiple vaccines that are this effective. And so I'm glad the doctors were wrong in that dimension and the scientists exceeded expectations. Uh, but you know, learn everything we possibly can, be humble about what we know. And one of my experiences from 2008 was prepare for it to get worse before it gets better. And 08, we kept getting surprised at how bad that crisis ultimately got. And so I think Congress and the Federal Reserve learned that lesson and said, let's err on doing too much rather than doing too little. And I think that really helped the economy bounce back as quickly as it is. Great. Well, thank you, Neil. We really appreciate you having in Montana and having you here at Benoit and hopefully come back in the winter when your kids are old enough to ski and they can experience <laughs> big sky or in the right way. That would be great. Thank <laughs> you for having me. I really appreciate it.